waiting. Uh, welcome uh, to Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture. We have returned to uh, CBEC Forum in the hybrid form. It's great to have people around the table as well as online. Uh, we're really pleased to have Dr. Sumaya with us at the CBEC Forum. And I, uh, before I go on to introduce Dr. Sumaya Sayyid Tariq, I'll uh, briefly introduce our center for those who may have joined in for the first time, especially those who are online. Uh, CBEC has been uh, working uh, since the past uh, uh, more than uh, 15 years. Uh, we established in 2004 and we provide educational resources for uh, bioethics as well as research within uh, within the field of bioethics. Uh, we have a postgraduate diploma program in biomedical ethics and a master's in bioethics. And we offer various courses uh, in research ethics and clinical ethics. We've been regularly holding the CBEC forum since, uh, since more than 10 years, but uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we had moved online for, uh, and started this other series of webinars, which were called CBEC on the web. We're really happy now to go back to CBEC forum because a lot of great discussions happen around the table. But we're equally pleased to see such a wide audience coming from different parts of Pakistan, as well as India and also UK. So great to have all of you. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Sumaya. Uh, um, Dr. Sumaya Sayyid Tariq, um, just going to introduce you very briefly, but I'll leave the rest to you. So Dr. Sumaya Sayyid Tariq is an additional police surgeon at the Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Karachi. She did her MBBS from Dow in 1996, followed by a, a diploma in medical jurisprudence from Dow as well in 2012. Currently, she's a member of the Parliamentary Committee, and she's also made several contributions to the Sindh medical legal reforms, which we are hoping to unpack a bit in this session if we get the time. And uh, she has worked in various courts, et cetera, as well. So we're really glad to have you here. Um, uh, so um, the format of the session uh, would be that we will initially start off with a brief introduction by, by Dr. Sumaya about the kind of work that she does. A couple of other questions uh, uh, that, that I will ask Dr. Sumaya. All of you are also welcome to, have, to also pitch in with your questions. But can we just briefly have a round of introduction of the participants around the table as well as online? Just a very brief introduction, your name and where you're from. So. Dr. Rubina Nakvi, nephrologist at SIUT. Dr. Tariq Suri from Civil Hospital, Karachi. Assalamualaikum, I'm Shaheen and I work with CBEC as an outreach associate. Uh, I am Farid bin Masood. Uh, I have just joined uh, CBEC last year and I'm a lecturer here. Bushra Shirazi at SIUT CBEC. Oh. Amir Jafri trying to just jump in, <coughs> um, work at CBEC. Okay, Dr. Asman Asim from SIUT and also an alumnus of CBEC. Dr. Farhat Mozum from CBEC. And I just realized I forgot to uh, <laughs> introduce myself. I'm also Swaleha Shikhani from CBEC. So maybe do, uh, we can just start off with Dr. Amar. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Amar Jassani. I'm uh, from uh, Indian Journal of Medical Ethics in Mumbai, India. Great to have you, Dr. Amar. Uh, can we have the... Adil? Yeah, sorry, I can't see. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Atif from Bittai Dental Medical College, and I've been uh, associated with the uh, CBAC, uh, I, I guess, 11 years back in my postgraduate diploma. Thanks. Lubna? Saima? Dr. Kurosilan from Beria. Saima, okay. Natasha, Saima and Natasha are both are associate faculty. Saima is from Islamabad, Natasha is from Lahore. Uh, Dr. Murad, are you online? Yes, I am. Dr. Murad Khan, Department of Psychiatry, uh, Khan University, but I'm currently in the UK. Okay. Dr. Nida, are you there? Ji, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Nida. 
I am associate faculty of CBEC and a surgeon at Jaudi Hospital Griffin campus. Dr. Shifa. Peace, alaikum everyone. Um, retired psychiatrist, visiting faculty at JPMC. Rabia. Thank you. Uh, Rabia. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Rabia. I am a gynecologist in Civil Hospital Karachi. Okay. Sujata. Uh, hello, this is Sujata. Uh, I'm from Sehat Organization. Okay. Safa. Okay, Dr. Tashfeen. Dr. Tashfeen's from AKU and also uh, interest with bioethics. I think with that, uh, Swaleha, you can probably. Thank you, Dr. Bushra. So um, we'll just start off with the, with the question. So uh, Dr. Somaya, the title of the forum borrows uh, words that you've used previously in your interviews, the bubbles of the society. So could you briefly elaborate on this and tell us a bit about your work as an additional police surgeon? Assalamu uh, alaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Sibek, uh, Dr. Mozam, Dr. Amir Jafri, Swaleha, and everybody else who's like uh, involved in inviting me here. It's, it's indeed an honor, a big honor. Um, my title, Additional Police Surgeon, basically, I'll, I'll deal with that first and then we come down to the bowels of society. I'm Additional Police Surgeon at Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center. And this job basically entails administrative supervision of the medical legal officers posted at JPMC, Medical Legal Section. Uh, my job is to oversee, to administrate, to make sure that things are going hunky-dory and there is no um, sort of, you know, uh, <laughs> no hanky-panky going on. That's my job. So medical legal examinations are being carried out and they are being conducted on time. Finals are being issued on time. Samples are being taken, chains of custody maintained. So it's all in all, it's basically supervision as far as my job goes, but it's 24 seven without a break, as I was lamenting a few minutes earlier with Dr. Mozam. So um, bowels of society, this actually, uh, which I used in a BBC Urdu, um, I used this four years back when I did a series with an animated series with Al Jazeera. So bowels is simply bowels. For those, for those of us who are from medical profession, we know what we mean by bowels. But for those who are not from medical profession, it's basically the intestinal intestines of your body where the entire fecal matter will then collect and uh, to be discharged later. So when I talk about bowels, I talk about it metaphorically because this is where I get to see the worst of the worst of the society, literally the worst of the worst. Um, I get to see rapes, I get to see child abuse, I get to see physical abuse, I get to see road traffic accidents, plane crashes, I get to see drowned bodies, I get to see children, women, men, mauled, maimed, murdered, suicide, committed suicide, and I get to see all sorts. And now, even now with psychological traumas, we are seeing a lot of that as well. So when I say I'm in the bowels of the society, I'm not exactly wrong. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Somaya. So we'll just start off with a brief uh, case discussion that, doctor, uh, that I would uh, ask Dr. Somaya to highlight. So is, has there been any incident or case that has really struck you and that really provided you a moral challenge while you were dealing with it? There have been so many that if I started uh, narrating uh, one, you know, that would be difficult. But our dilemma has been uh, like its professional obligations and my personal inclinations or personal feelings at that particular time. Mm, the dilemma that we face, especially on a daily basis, regularly, is when cases of self-harm, they come to us. Girl, boy, woman, man is in a condition which might or might not mandate treatment. So now we are stuck because such cases will be referred to us for medical legal documentation. Once we document the medical legal report, now I'm talking about a self-harm, which is a taboo. And if I were to document the case, um, police will be involved. 
So once police is involved, without let me clarify that without medical legal documentation, treatment cannot be initiated. How, how, even though we have AMAL Act, but that AMAL Act is applicable only in emergency situations, not in self-harm cases, not in cases which require a longish period of medication. So I now I'm in a professional dilemma. Shall I or shouldn't I? By law, I, am, I have to, because then the police has to get involved. But since suicide attempt is punishable and it's a taboo and it's a stigma, I don't know what to do. That is, I think, this is particularly the case that I see every day. And there are times when I really don't know what to do. So a woman comes to us and she says, okay, she has taken like, you know, four tablets, Azolam, or maybe, you know, a, a whole patta of uh, a whole a strip of Panadol or Paracetamol. And I really don't know what to do because if I refer that case to NPCC without medical legal documentation, NPCC being a National Poison Control Center at JPMC, they will not accept the case for treatment. She might need treatment. So that's the dilemma. G. So uh, just for, for clarification, so these people who, the examples you gave, how do they arrive how do they come to you? Do they come themselves? Are they referred? Okay. What is the process? The point of entry, basically. Yes. The point of entry is the ER JPMC, emergency room of JPMC. I'm at JPMC, so technically right. they will all come to ER. Once they come to the ER, they are automatically referred to us, being, you know, cases of self-harm, ingestion, or even uh, they might have incised themselves, cut themselves repeatedly. Some I have seen who actually tried to hang themselves and were saved midway. So we have cases coming to us constantly in a constant flow on an average daily basis. I get about 10 to 12 cases, 10 to 12 such cases on a daily basis. I have to, I'm duty bound that my MLOs should write that case. It should be um, entered into the police log. Police should be informed. Their blood sample and urine sample should be taken. They should be referred to the correct uh, department and for treatment provision. And at the same time, I will hand over the samples or the MLO concerned will hand over the collected samples, sealed collected samples to the police wala so that they can be taken to the concerned government lab for uh, onward reporting. Can I just G, please. for clarity, when you say self-harm, does that automatically mean attempted suicide? Is that an automatic or is it uh, because then the process would matter? Yeah. And uh, somebody coming, taking, let's say, six tablets or 12 tablets of paracetamol, right? I would have a question in my mind, is this attempted suicide or is this and does that person need a psychiatric evaluation before coming to you? So that yes. person is coming to you straight prior. So is it an automatic suicide concept not, or? Not to me directly. They come to the ER. Yeah, yeah. And but... it's like an automatic. It's not exactly a, a concept. It's more like this, that they are required by law to be reported in the police. If they come to the medical legal section, they will not be treated. Like you said, uh, six tablets of paracetamol, that will probably not mandate any uh, treatment. She will probably be able to, you know, she or he will probably be able to excrete it out of the system and all will be well. But we can't really be sure. So for that, I have developed special SOPs. Now we categorically refer such cases to psychiatry. We make sure that in addition to the medical treatment that they're getting, we, they also get psychiatric referrals. We are trying, but this wasn't done initially. This wasn't being done initially, but now it's quite uh, rare to see a case not being referred. That's what we are trying to do. We are trying to send them to people who will then distinguish whether this is, uh, uh, this is a, a suicidal attempt or this is a, just a, what was it? What was behind it? Because see, being medical legal officers, that does not, does, it's rather you know, overstepping of my uh, expertise to declare something which I'm not, uh, capable enough to declare or not expert enough to declare. So that's what, yes, self-harm, in other words, is taken as slash suicidal attempt. 
so it, even if it is for example for my clarification it could it could just be one off self harm act but you can never be sure so that is why it's important to refer for psychiatric evaluation exactly, exactly. and before being referred for psych uh, psychiatric evaluation if they have to uh, if they're reporting at medic at any medical legal center they have to uh, it has to be reported as a medical legal case right before it, treatment is initiated it has to be because that sort of is the requirement a prerequisite from all uh, wards where there was where such a person will be treated you can never be sure with such cases if it's like an ingestion you can never be sure how much of a treatment will be required so we can't really take a risk of not sending that person to the relevant department there are cases acha this this results in a very it's a catch 22 situation we the moment we tell them that we are going to report this case and we are going to involve the police as well i think about 50% of the cases disappear we really don't know they simply leave we don't know about their fate so essentially we are putting them at a, a risk of we don't know what kind of complications they leave because of this that's why it's even more pertinent that we make attempted suicide a non punishable offense that's what we are like thinking towards ji dr murad musa has actually put in the chat uh, some facts about the um, Suicide. Suicide attempts, he says, are criminalized in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan Penal Code three twenty four. All self harm acts are considered suicide attempts, no matter how benign. Uh, there are on an average three to four thousand cases of poisoning at NPCC every year. Majority are self poisoning. What's NPCC? National Poison Control okay. Center. So, so that was a, an important interjection from Dr. Murad, uh-huh. and. Uh, uh npcc will on, not admit any patient without a medical legal uh, yeah. case and that's the ppc you know, 325 324 uh, 324 is basically attempted murder attempted murder 324 hota hai to wohi wala jo hai wo apply ho jata hai it gets applied on the uh, uh that you are trying to murder yourself that in other words committing suicide so npcc has a protocol we are supposed to we are duty bound to make the medical legal certificate inform the police and send the patient for treatment wherever and now we have added this ki psychiatric referral is important let's refer them to psychiatry let's get them treated for it because i feel that attempted suicide is a cry for help if we are not intervening if we are not blocking it there if we are not if we are blocking it there and we are not listening to the patient so next time around we'll see a case which will be um, a full a fully committed suicide like a full completed suicide yeah can i can i ask a question and as we also have dr murad there um so this is these are people who come into the public hospital any public hospital go to the er say have tried to overdose or whatever and they are referred to you Gee. i'm just curious i mean we live in a part of the world which is socio economically divided into different levels ji so my question is and uh, dr uh, murad would also have experience in that if that same individual goes to a private hospital directly the family takes the person there to a psychiatrist in that particular case what happens does that story then run differently from somebody who presents to a public hospital emergency room to be very honest we get cases which are getting out of hand where uh, someone has taken drugs say about uh, a day back and then now they are not waking up so the family waited for a long time they waited and they let it you know they thought maybe she'll get better or he'll get better or whatever the case may be i've seen cases like 14 year old boy and maybe 16 year old girl maybe you know even elderly so the family will wait we are, i'm talking about a socio economic stratum which is not exactly it doesn't exactly have the money but they have the means to do it they suffer from psychological issues which have till that time remained unaddressed and chances are that they will remain un- unaddressed uh as far as the uh, uh, better uh, uh, socio economic better socio economic uh, stratum is concerned they would probably take the patient their patient far earlier to even a private hospital where stomach wash can be done or treatment can be initiated and that's a different story because then they get a referral without involving the police that depends on the kind of money that you have see everything money opens doors to be very frank 
money opens doors but people coming to us they are at a disadvantage in the fa- in the sense that we are just giving them treatment at that time and even then we are giving it giving them a treatment at the expense of involving the police so police you know how police works you know how medico legal system works so it's better to disappear and if they disappear we don't know what happens to the individual so dr murad wants to say something yes is it okay uh, swalia if dr murad can actually speak absolutely i was just going to ask yeah. him but uh, yeah thanks uh, uh, farat and thank you uh, dr swalia the issue of suicide is a really complex one one it is criminalized still there's a move to decriminalize it but it's stuck in the islamic ideology council the senate passed it very recently uh, and once uh, i uh, islamic ideology council passes it approves it then go to the national assembly for it to be discussed and then passed before it is decriminalized so it's it's a huge uh, hurdle and a challenge the average estimated average of 20000 suicides in pakistan these are who estimates because we don't have national statistics and for every suicide there are about 20 self harm acts so there's an average of anything between 2 lakhs to 4 lakhs self harm acts so dr subhayya jo keh rahi thi just to add on to that the people who can afford go to the private hospitals private facilities there they do not label that as a suicide attempt or self harm they labeled as a, some sort of a medical diagnosis they do not uh, get it registered uh, with the medical legal certificate which they should by law uh, and then they are sent home so these cases never get counted we don't know it's only the very poor who come to places like jpmc or if the cases are very serious and the private hospital thinks that this patient may die and this may become a police case then they refer them to jinnah uh, or civil or abasi shahid mostly jinnah because that's the npcc is over there Uh, if it's self poisoning but otherwise uh, all the less serious cases they treat it themselves mislabel and then they go home even at jina no patient and we are currently doing a study at jina we are doing one with dr sumaiya on the medical legal register and another one is setting up a surveillance system at the ad no patient gets a psychiatric evaluation underline that in fact all over pakistan except for one or two places ek is probably an exception patients with self harm get a psychiatric evaluation mayo hospital mein i'm trying to put in a study in lahore wo to <laughs> they don't even write self harm or self poisoning anywhere is is one of the biggest public sector hospital shifa hospital in islamabad uh, dr saif has there dr wahab i'm working with him he's, he's a psychiatrist उन्होंने नोटिस लगाया हुआ है कि वी डू नॉट एंटरटेन सेल्फ हार्म केसेस तो इट्स अ ह्यूज प्रॉब्लम एंड व्हाट डॉक्टर सुमैया इज सेइंग रेडी इट इज इट इज द बाउज ऑफ द सोसाइटी थैंक्स लेट मी मे आई या आई आई वाज जस्ट क्यूरियस डॉक्टर मुराद व्हाट डू यू थिंक अबाउट पीपल एक्चुअली फिजिशियन सेइंग वी विल नॉट एंटरटेन सच पेशेंट्स well ethically uh can you hear me yes ha huh? yeah I, i'm not surprised because uh, uh, partly it's it's a uh, lack of uh, knowledge information psychiatry is not taught in any medical college in pakistan uh, or, or very few uh, certainly not examined anywhere so they have no exposure to these issues and then suicide is criminalized there are very strong religious prohibitions against self harm as you know in in quran uh, so people kind of think it doesn't happen in pakistan in islamic republic how can something like this happen and there's a social stigma to it so no one wants to bother about this and where they can they just you know just patch it up sweep it under the carpet and therefore it never comes uh, to to be discussed so i'm i'm really not surprised and the attitudes study that have been done about the attitudes of the er staff for self harm cases will really tell you that patients when they do and make an attempt and go there they say that, that is probably the biggest deterrent the law or religion is not the deterrent but the attitude of the staff in the er is the biggest deterrent things like ye drama karke phir aa gayi hai 
ये तो कोई पता नहीं क्या है खुद से किया है टाइम वेस्ट कर रही है या कर रहा है सो दीज आर द काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स दैट पीपल जनरली हैव एन एटीट्यूड टू वर्ड सेल्फ हार्म केसेस एंड दैट्स व्हाई आई एम नॉट सरप्राइज्ड व्हेन दे यू नो द राइट दैट वी डू नॉट एंटरटेन सेल्फ हार्म केसेस सो इट्स इट्स अ ह्यूज ह्यूज इशू वन ऑफ द मेनी डॉक्टर डॉक्टर सुमन यू यू हैड समथिंग टू से जी अम there are two aspects actually um for doctors who put up a sign on their uh, door saying that uh, self harm patients uh, will not be entertained here i think it's more of a self preservation kind of a thing they don't want to be involved in anything that might go wrong because like i said it never really it never really know, you never one re- never really knows how a self harm case would go never really know we we feel that the uh, cell phone patient is okay for a while but like 2 hours later they've crashed and now they're dead so we really don't know how it will so it's more of a self preservation thing and uh no i i feel it's unethical and illegal to refuse a so patient so that was my point yeah it's unethical and illegal to do that you cannot I, and uh, okay. it would not be thank you the one two uh, uh, as far as the psychiatric uh, referral goes we we would ask the patient to visit the psychiatry but they don't because i've kept in touch with uh, uh, dr javed over there and he hardly gets any of my referrals if i've referred them and i've referred patients who were supposedly very padha likha they belong to uh, better families they belong to a better background in the sense that they were educated and they had money but they wouldn't go because again it's a taboo they don't want to be seen there so it's more like this ke uh, there are several things at play here uh, we have doctors who are um, sort of you know shunning such patients ke drama karke aa gayi hai ya drama karke aa gaya hai see they are landing up again and again and i think second time around such cases if they are landing up in the er that's even more of a uh, 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 even even worse of a signal because see they are doing they are following a pattern so like i said it's a catch 22 situation you do this you are like you know for want of a better term you don't know whether you, you are doing the right thing or not and you do that you really don't know whether you're doing the right thing or not so essentially it takes all to play this game there's a comment uh, uh, dr amar was sharing some experience from india uh, so if it is possible dr amar could tell us yeah on dr his mic. Do, yeah come on nahi dr amar please unmute your mic Oh, sorry. I I already wrote it on charts, so I I thought everybody might have read it. Uh, no, what I was saying was that in India we decriminalized uh, uh, suicide uh, way back in two thousand eighteen, when we passed uh, what is called Mental Health Care Act, uh, and uh, uh, along with that, uh, I think quite a few new things happened. When you decriminalize, you also understand that uh, unless you destigmatize. the mere decriminalization is not going to help and that's how in india there is a massive campaign to not call say no never use the term committed suicide but you say that person died of suicide never talk about person attempted suicide but say that person suffered from suicide so these are the things that uh, changes the mindset of both doctors as well as uh, as people around but once you say that uh, they are responsible for what that what has happened to them then uh, the 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 stereotypes will emerge and the prejudices will come i think that happens also in uh, domestic violence it also happens in the sexual assault where we consider the victim as the responsible person she must have done something that's why it has happened to her right and that's why most of us who are in the medical profession have a lot of stigma and prejudices against them and that's why we may not treat them or we may treat them badly or i think more importantly in medical legal cases we try we don't try to create enough medical evidence to really get justice for them if a person has died of suicide or a person has survived suicide if we create a good medical record and uh, really testify there are all the chances that that person may not get criminally you know penalized by explaining that what actually lead to the suicide both uh, in terms of mental health as well as social consequences i think i have also seen it in domestic violence and uh, uh, sexual assault but if medical legal work is done well and the evidence is collected properly 
there is a better chance of getting justice for the victim. I think that requires both decriminalization and destigmatization. I think that helps. Uh, Dr. Samir, do you have anything to add on this or can we move on to the Please next question? It was very so I think, piece. Yeah, so I think we've had some good discussion about uh, the aspects of suicide uh, that uh, Dr. Somaya regularly deals with the work. Another important area that she works is in and uh, that was also mentioned by Dr. Amar was domestic violence. So I, I, I believe that you probably face some of these uh, dilemmas about reporting, etc. over there. So how do you navigate that area? A lot of these, they would come to us uh, mostly these injuries will be seen or passed off as someone who has fallen down and uh, probably not reported to us. So it's, it's basically the index of suspicion that will probably report it to us. There are two aspects. Someone doesn't want to get known because uh, she, she or abused at home. And trust me, I've seen male domestic abuse cases as well. So they will get treated in the uh, routine work or I might even get a child and call and get a call from uh, um, pediatrics where we will have someone who has a high index of suspicion and they will report the case to us. Then we jump in and we make the medical legal certificate, involve the police. The pathway that involves uh, police being involved before us. So police is approached by the victim and they, then they come to us with a police letter for medical legal documentation. So that's how it works. So we have a point of entry, which is through the doctors, like anywhere, any ward, any department, even gynae. I get to see a lot of cases from being referred to us from gynae ward, saying uh, there's a case of marital, marital abuse, maybe even sexual abuse to the extent that we may even have uh, oral uh, sexual abuse, maybe even anal abuse. That depends on the kind of cases. That so we get referrals from doctors from dif in different wards, depending again upon their index of suspicion, depending upon how perceptive they are and how, how much of responsibility they are willing to take. So I think all in all, it works. When I say a medical legal is where all the fields of medicine and surgery, they come together. I'm not wrong because I get to see cases which involve neurosurgery. I get to see cases which involve psychiatry. I get to see cases which involves ENT, I, gynae, anywhere. The medical legal is essentially the one field where all uh, um, these different area, areas, they come together. Uh, connected to this, if I may ask, and uh, there are uh, if there are other questions online, uh, you guys are welcome to raise your hands or also post them in the chat box. We are closely monitoring the chat box. Dr. Bushra, you can ask a question. Yeah, I, I will not disagree with you when you say that, you know, everything focuses towards you. However, but I would also say you're somehow like a neglected child. <laughs> Please don't get me started on that. Oh. Be because, I mean, I would find it actually scary to refer someone to you. Yes, I agree. Because I think that in some ways is jeopardizing the person more. Yep. And um, I mean, so in all these years, there's got to be some kind of system that gives some protection because soon as someone's going to a medical legal, that person's becoming a vulnerable person for whatever reason, Yeah. right? Whether it's life or whether it's stigma, whatever. So I would actually be apprehensive and do go down a wrong route in yeah. saying, okay, let, let me try. Now I'm not equipped at all, you know, but I would still have a lot of uh, inhibitions in sending uh, the concerned victim inverted commas to you okay um so let me go through that victim to victim it varies yes i agree uh medical legal is one of the most uh feared we don't i i, I didn't I, I didn't use the word focus it says it actually all the uh, facilities all these uh, subspecialities they come together in medical legal section not focused as in referral pathways because we need to have all the referral pathways my my patients my uh, victims are coming or going all over the medical world. So um, victim to victim, how shall I give you an example? Let me see. So we have a case of a woman, which is again, a very common thing. She uh, goes to department of orthopedics for a fractured um, bone and is, she has multiple fractures, sustained multiple fractures. She, have, she has given a history that she has fallen down. 
So um, such a case when referred to us might not get referred to us because I don't think the doctor will have high indic that high an index of suspicion to even suspect domestic abuse. So that case doesn't get referred to us. Another case, another on the other end of the spectrum is a case of child sexual abuse. Now, let me give you an example, which I have uh, sort of uh, completed the case this year. This was four years back when Dr. Femina, Professor Femina, Pediatrics of Pediatrics uh, Civil Hospital, she called me up and she said, Kisumaya, I want, to, I want you to come and see a case. I have a strong suspicion that this child has been abused. The child was on ventilator. It had been two days since he had been, she had been received in ER. She was two and a half years old. She had been, uh, she was living, uh, mom and dad were separated. So she was living with her nani. Uh, mother, nani, they were working. She was left home alone with uh, her mamu, and the neighbor neighbor had come and taken her taken her to his own home, where he had two young daughters, almost of the same age, at the pretext that she will be playing with them. The neighbor's wife had gone off to her mother's place, taking the two daughters with them, leaving this girl at the mercy of that neighbor for two whole days. For after two days, she was brought back, wrapped in a, a, a blanket, back to the house. And they had been looking all over for the girl and none, she, she couldn't be found anywhere. And when it had gotten a hue and cry had gotten out of hand and it, it, it had gotten onto the social media, the same neighbor's wife brought back the girl saying that she was found on the Kachra Kundi right next to our house. She was brought to trauma center. Trauma center treatment was initiated. Department of uh, Pediatrics was involved. Dr. Femina. Had the had the highest index of, index of suspicion. I must, you know, it was basically because of her. I got involved in the case. I started examining her, and she had multiple injuries. She had bruises all over her vulva. She had bruises, burn, uh, burnt, uh, uh, um, um, cigarette uh, cigarette burns all over her body. She had fractured skull. She had uh, she was going into a renal shutdown. She was put on ventilator. She remained on dialysis for three months. When I was done with the medical legal documentation, it was the entire page was black and still I had enough findings to write on the overleaf. And see, that's the victim I'm talking about. That's the victim I'm talking about. If she didn't, if Dr. Femina had not picked it up, I would not have gotten involved. And now, four years later, I went to court to testify there I was asked, why didn't I take the vaginal swab samples? And I had written it in my certificate that vaginal, swab, swab, vaginal swabs could not be collected, anal swabs could not be collected because of lapse of time. One, two, treatment already provided. Two, three, stitched wounds in there. Uh, with uh, ointments application, I could not take the samples, but I had written enough findings to merit a 10-year sentence for the accused. And I followed it up. I followed it up. So that's the kind of victim that I'm talking about. We have different kinds. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Mark. Okay. So, um, you know, the case that you've just pointed out, um, it's horrifying, but unfortunately, that's not the only case. I mean, there's so many of those. What this points out to me is um, the fact if we are producing, I don't know how many thousands of doctors that graduate every year, and what is the focus in the medical education? One thing, of course, is that it's something like this, it shouldn't be just one person who picks it up. So how well are they educated in that? And the other thing is, which is, which we've talked about all the time, is that what we're churning out are people who are skilled, you know, the technical skills, and even those we don't do very well, but at least kuch na kuch to unko sikha dete hai na. Lekin uske saad jo ek physician ki jo baaki jo characteristics hai, which go beyond that to compassion, to caring for other people, because aap the profession mein. To ye dono cheeze jo hai, it seems to be missing. Currently, what is the education as far as forensic medicine is concerned in medical colleges? Dr. Moazam, my point after um, 
you know, uh, after uh, studying the subject for almost 23 years, I did my post-graduation in 2012, completed it in 2012. And then now I'm doing my FCPS. I've studied the integrated modular system, the spiral systems and all the new systems that we are getting. So it has been my subject, forensic medicine has been reduced to, I think, eight months. That's it. Uh, there are two aspects of forensic medicine. Let me clarify. One is the academics that is being taught in any university, any medical college. And the other one is the medical legal. That's the practical forensic medicine. Both are unrelated and related at the same time. Meaning, for example, if I were to teach a, surgical, a surgery student about appendicitis and appendectomy and uh, the times that the appendectomy will be carried out or might not be carried out, how to carry it out, but I don't allow that person to practice. So I'm churning out a theoretical surgeon. Same is the case over here. We are churning out forensic experts who have never been into medical legal world. I have had the best of both worlds. I have done practical forensic medicine for, for almost 23 years now, practical medical legal for almost 23 years now. And I've been involved with academics, academic forensic medicine since 2011. So that's almost 11 years. So I've had the best of both worlds and I totally understand why we are churning out doctors the way we are. Our doctors, our medical student has had an exposure of six months, eight months at the most of my subject. That's it. And then they're totally forgotten. I am even advocating that house job, this is what I've advocated in uh, Ministry of Law and Justice, that if medical education reforms are required to be, they should be carried out, house job should be offered in the medical legal section. Two months, make it mandatory. Let them come and work here because you never really know how many of us will eventually go to the government jobs and they will, they will, they will require, they will be required to see them. Then I have all, I'm also advocating that uh, forensic medicine should be included in the nursing protocol as well. And it should also have uh, protocols in BDS, like forensic odontology. Our dentists don't even know the first thing. Uh, the first thing that gets hit is probably the teeth. And my dentist, if, if my dental surgeon, I had to call uh, the dental surgeon, a junior dental surgeon who was reporting the cases, the medical legal cases, to tell him, to educate him, okay, what is it that I want from him? So Dr. Mazam, to be very frank, we are churning out people who are good academicians, but not practical people but not practical. They don't know the nuances of the real medical legal world. If I were to give them two bones, two fractured bones and ask them to differentiate just on the basis of looking to whether this is an antemortem fracture or a postmortem fracture, they will not be able to tell me what kind of forensic experts are we producing? What kind of? So, so if I want to be a forensic officer, or whatever, if I have an MBBS, I can become yeah, that? You can. My first posting when I- That's it? Yeah, that's it. CMBs? Yeah, that's it. That's it. 23 years back, my I had done my um, commission, uh, cleared that. And um, then we I talked to um, uh, Sumru Saab, um, the orthopedic Sumru Saab, And I requested him, sir, please uh, get me and get me a please get me a posting, which is in Karachi, because I won't be able to go out. I'm domiciled here. So he sent me to the DG, then his bosom friend. And I got my job at police surgeon office Karachi. That's how I got it. And I feel that was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. But all of the people who joined with me, I think we were a total of 15 who joined. I'm the only one who has survived so far. Only one in 23 years. And that's because I was fascinated with the subject. I wanted to do this. Sort of continued on. Hello. Fadi. Okay, so there, there is okay, yeah. Your hand raised. Can you would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Hello. Hey, you, Hello. We can, we can hear you loud and clear. If you yeah. want to switch yeah. your video on, also that would be great. Okay. One. So. Uh, मैं एक सेहत नाम की ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के साथ काम करती हूं जो अस्पतालों में काम करती है और हमारा संबंध 
लैंगिक हिंसा पीड़ित महिलाओं और लड़कियों के साथ आता है काफी बात और अभी आप जब इसके बारे में बात कर रही थी तो आ, मुझे समझ में आ रहा था कि हमारे जो आ, मतलब कुछ परेशानियां हैं वो बिल्कुल मिटती जुटी हैं तो मुझे इसको ही लेकर कुछ सवाल आपसे पूछने थे और जानना था कि पाकिस्तान में इन सब चीजों के बारे में आ, क्या किया जाता है या वहां पर किस तरह की परिस्थिति है तो एक तो होता है कि मेडिकल लीगल एग्जामिनेशन जब होता है सेक्शुअल वायलेंस सेक्शुअल वायलेंस के बाद तो आपके यहाँ किस तरह की एग्जामिनेशन होती हैं और जो रिपोर्ट है क्या वो यूनिफॉर्म है या अलग अलग अस्पतालों में अलग अलग तरीके की रिपोर्ट्स बनाई जाती हैं दूसरा सैंपल कलेक्शन के बारे में जैसे आपने मेंशन किया कि टाइम लैब्स की वजह से आपने जो अपने केस नरेट थी उसमें आप सैंपल कलेक्ट कर नहीं पाई थी पर काफी बार देखा जाता है कि डॉक्टर्स मतलब असोल्ट जो है या वायलेंस जो है वो कितने भी पुराना हो उनका हमेशा जोर रहता है सैंपल कलेक्ट करने पे तो इसके बारे में वहां पे क्या सम, मतलब समझा जाता है दूसरा एज एस्टिमेशन और दूसरी चीजों को लेकर था कि इन सब बारों एज एस्टिमेशन हम मतलब हमेशा देखा जाता है कि अगर एज प्रूफ ना हो तो किया जाना बेहतर होता है पर कई मामलों में ऐसा होता है कि सभी को बोल देते हैं एज एस्टिमेशन करने के लिए जब जरूरत भी ना हो दूसरा हाइमन पर कमेंट करना अब यहाँ पे तो एमओ एच एफ डब्ल्यू का जो गाइडलाइन है मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ एंड फैमिली वेलफेयर का उसमें बताया गया है कि हाइमन पर कमेंट करना मैंडेटरी नहीं है अगर उसकी जो इंजरी है वो फ्रेश नहीं है अगर पुराना हुई है तो उसके बारे में क्या है और लास्ट था कि मेडिकल लीगल सैंपल्स कलेक्ट करने में एक टाइम होता है जैसे डब्ल्यू एच ओ ने बताया है कि सेवन टू आवर्स तक ही मेडिकल लीगल सैंपल्स जो है वो कलेक्ट किए जा सकते हैं तो उसको लेकर क्या मान्यता है Uh, thank you so much, Sujata. That is possibly, you know, that is the close, the subject closest to my heart because I'm member parliamentary committee on anti-rape investigation and trial act 2021. Um, currently working on the guidelines for the same. Uh, our, uh, I will be talking about in two different angles: what was, what is, and what will be. Actually, three different angles. So, what was, yeah, what is, is that there is no standard pro forma all over Pakistan for anything. um my work in send medical legal reforms committee uh, uh, i was a, i am a secretary there under the supervision of professor farat farat husain mirza uh, that uh, led to uh, uh, development of a protocol for cases of sexual abuse now uh, for in my work in parliamentary committee uh, for anti rape act has a sort of uh, a sort of you know um, we have uh, elaborated and improved upon the existing uh, definition of rape by involving object rape and by involving male rape and by involving marital rape and buckle rape as well so uh, and we are hoping uh, we are working currently on guidelines sops best medical legal practices i am uh, preparing a manual for which will be eventually presented to uh, the uh, ministry of law and justice for vetting and process uh, alongside unfpa and um, legal aid society so we are basically developing protocols which i've already done in sin medical legal reforms committee that will ensure that uh, we have a standard pro forma implemented all over pakistan and uh, that will have pictograms it will include uh, this pro forma will not only be for sexual uh, female sexual abuse but also for male sexual abuse and then again it will have a, 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 a um, examination of the active agent the person who commits the rape because i feel that's the most overlooked part of any sexual assault examination one this was my answer to the uniform pro forma or uniform standard the the psyche behind this is that for someone who is as experienced as myself like say about 23 years of experience with me but for someone who has been in the field maybe about 2 years ago or maybe about 6 months back but they are doctors so we give them a protocol in front of them they we give them sops which will ensure that if they fill up the entire pro forma according to the headings provided they will have Uh, a decent enough uh, a, a, a decent enough certificate to be 
presented in a court of law that will uphold the admissibility and that will uphold the uh, cross examination and eventually lead to either conviction or acquittal depending upon the samples whatever the sample says or whatever the examination says or wherever the testimony takes as far as your sample collection question is concerned yes we follow the uh, who protocol but we have sort of elaborated on it the uh, supreme court has re recently made it mandatory that all rape examinations should be done within ideally should be done within 6 hours of incident obviously it's not possible for every single one of them so we have sort of elaborated on them in the sense that ideal condition would be like 72 hours but we are not ruling out five days we are not ruling out seven days we are not ruling out you know even 10 11 days and as far as the case which i narrated uh, was is concerned uh, i gave specific reasons as to why i did not collect the samples now this is where i feel my medical legal colleagues lack they don't ethically i'm duty bound to uh, actually say okay, why I didn't do a certain thing which was a part of my SOP's guideline why didn't I do this so I gave the reason there okay, the, the child had been uh, medically and surgically uh, uh, treated and that had resulted in loss of vital samples that will eventually hold up in court of law see uh, the point the problem with our uh, um, our part of the world is that we don't look beyond our jobs uh, my job doesn't end with the medical legal documentation. My job can actually carry me all the way to maybe, you know, whenever the whenever I am heard in court and I will have to withstand the cross examination as well. I think that's where uh, you guys I, I, I'm believing she's from India. So India is light years ahead of us in yes. terms of medical legal, light years ahead of us. We are still in the Bronze Age, maybe Stone Age. I'm not sure. Maybe Bronze. OK, Bronze. I'll give myself Bronze. So... <laughs> So we are still, we are taking baby steps. We are, it's, it's, it was a fight for me to uh, have minor boys uh, sodomy cases labeled as male rape. And I had to fight for that. You know, I had to fight for object rape and I had to, it was not just, I, it was difficult for me to establish or to even explain to the members of the committee that it's not just the penile penetration, which will cause rape. It, objects can be used other parts of the body can be used i mean like i said it's all baby steps then I, i'll come down to your sample collection i think i've answered that we are following the protocol and uh, i'm hoping with uh, most of us will be trained to the level where it becomes you know we come at par or slightly closer to your standards age estimation yes police the uh, in our part of the world in in in, in pakistan it's the prerogative of the police or the court to order age estimation. Our legal age is like 18 years. So establishing 18 years is mandatory. Anyone suspected to be between 17 to 18 has to be declared as closer to 18 or 17 by law or over 18. That depends. So age estimation, yes, is done in routine uh, in cases who are suspected to be between 18, 19, 20 to rule out whether they are really 18 or not or over or under because then the juvie law or the juvie, juvie uh, justice system comes in. Number one. Number two, age estimation criteria is uh, not same all over. And it's taken again for medical legal reforms committee. We have developed a criteria which still awaits implementation so we are we, we are hoping that it will once it gets implemented and i'm adding the age uh, estimation protocol in uh, the rape manual in the manual that i'm preparing for the uh, federal ministry of law and justice so we are adding that too because what will happen is k uh, for victims who are at the precarious age of 18 16 even less will then be uh, subjected to a uniform standard protocol see radio, uh, age estimation cannot be done just on the basis of physical examination it has to be done with physical examination along with radiological evidences so it's a uh, it's a collaboration between radiology the medical legal and the medical legal administration so we have like a board kind of a thing and then let's come down to the hymen part Hyman part in uh, I have conducted trainings all over Pakistan and uh, my last training uh, which I conducted was in uh, 2019 for uh, medical officers all over sin. Hymen is the be all and end all in our part of the world virginity whether virgin or not a virgin. 
Uh, but now we are trying to tell our uh, trainees that hymen is not the part that they should be looking at. We are telling them to look at posterior commissure. We are telling them to look at forchet. We are telling them to look at labia majora, labia minora. So essentially, like I said, baby steps. But yes, we have added these descriptions into the uh, per vaginal examination part of the pro forma. Lastly, um, in a landmark judgment, uh, Justice Aisha and then uh, Justice Mazhar Sahab in Sindh High Court, they have um, um, sort of um, made the two finger test illegal. So I had the honor of replying for the Natasha Lakhani petition in Sindh High Court on this two finger test. We have abolished that. And now we are trying our women medical legal officers who examine our female victims to give it up as well. But it's a long battle and uh, I don't hope to win anytime soon. There is a question by Dr. Murad and I'll read it out to you. Um, so it's, it's regarding, uh, it's, it's, what so, what, so what kind of support? No, uh, yeah, so uh, the question was that uh, there is a common perception that there's a lot of corruption in medical legal processes in Pakistan. Is it true that MLO posts are actually sold for lakhs of rupees? Uh, how do you deal with such corruption if this is true? I'll have to be bindas on this. Yes. Yes, there's a lot of corruption. Yes. I, I have, there are no two views about it. Yes, there's a lot of corruption. And uh, MLO posts used to be sold, but now it's more like this, that if I want to get out of ML section, I'll have to. It's, it's like this. How do I deal with that? I face harassment daily from my colleagues daily harassment. If I tell my colleague to do their job well, I will be faced harassing charges the very next day. So it's something which I um, face on a daily basis. It's a fight, a constant fight, a constant battle. And uh, currently I'm at JPMC and I have nine MLOs. Uh, all of them, all of them, they don't take bribe. I am lucky in the sense that none of them are involved in bribe taking. And I have three WMLOs, none of them are into bribe taking. So essentially, I have a very, uh, actually, that has my post in itself, where I am sitting is a lucrative post in terms of bribes, hence the reason why I'm being harassed. So either I leave, or I'm being made to leave by, you know, my harassers, by constant complaints against me that why am I uh, sitting, still sitting there? So that's about it. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Well, I hope you continue to sit there, Dr. Sumaya, and for a very long time. You mentioned marital rape. What, where does, what is the current law in Pakistan as far as, is that accepted as an entity or not? No, madam, still not. No, Dr. Muslim, it's still not accepted because our, um, our psyche, our mindset is such that marital rape does not occur. So if it's happening, though it's a normal practice. Huh, I have written marital rape in terms of buckle rape. I have written marital rape in terms of anal rape, but not in terms of vaginal rape. Okay, so, so the buckle and the anal rape, is that, would that hold up in law? Yes, that holds up. In that law. holds, that up, holds in up in law. But as far as the vaginal rape is concerned, uh, the law doesn't take um, a very merciful eye towards it. Law or perhaps the people involved. But, but is there any uh, act, for instance, within, uh, within our legal system that actually uh, recognizes marital rape? I'm not... Yes, yes. Initially, uh, what the rape, uh, the, the, the definition of rape used to include not his wife, but that has been excluded since then. So rape, yes, marital rape is identified per se law now. It's identified. The, 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 the statement not his wife has been removed. Uh, we have uh, Amar Jasani raising his hand and uh, then Dr. Murad has another question after that. Uh, yeah, in India also, marital rape is not recognized. And uh, there is a challenge, a court case going on in uh, Delhi High Court. I think uh, this uh, hearing was reported very regularly in the media. And there is a massive you know, debate going on. But I have, I have some other questions. So, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, 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 Dr. Amar, uh, yeah. 
So in India, so the, the three varieties of rape that Dr. Sumaya is, is spoken about here, is that how it is legally in India also? Buccal, anal, and vaginal? Any, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's no longer penile rape as, uh, as the rape defined. It's, uh, it's, it's defined as more as a sexual assault of any kind. Okay, thank so, you. So it can, yeah. So I have, I have three other questions. Uh, first is, uh, you know, I, I, I joined this meeting because uh, a woman from, from forensic medicine is speaking. My own uh, uh, experience of forensic medicine are extremely bad. When I was medical student in 70s and later on, highly patriarchal, highly prejudiced against women. And uh, the Indian uh, forensic medicine uh, textbook, I got reviewed uh, way back in 2004 and five, and the papers on that were published uh, in Indian journals. And they found that the Indian forensic textbooks were highly prejudiced against women. Even, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the best of the textbooks of uh, India, Modi's textbooks of forensic medicine, he used to start on, the, on, on rape the, with this sentence saying that uh, the, the victim could be lying, you know, so that's how, uh, how bad it was. My second question, so how do, how do you find yourself in uh, forensic medicine and how you are being treated as a woman you know, forensic expert? My second question is, uh, I think there was a point raised about, uh, about uh, 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 the cases of violence and uh, <laughs> there is a lot of sound. Oh, there is a, there is a, there is a, I think, point raised about that. And in domestic violence, uh, we try to do experiments by borrowing a model from, uh, from uh, Malaysia and Philippines, where we created, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the crisis center for women within the hospital where uh, the other departments could uh, refer the cases to them. And they are the multidisciplinary crisis center with the lawyer available, with social workers available and all, and also having a direct link with the police department. And they provide the support to the woman. And uh, that way, you know, now in India, we, whenever there is a domestic violence case, you have to have a, an officer, not the medicated, the, the policeman, but to take care of it. And women should be provided protection within the household. It is not that woman has to be there, leave, leave the household. So we started this kind of uh, uh, you know, support centers for, for domestic violence women within the public hospital and private hospital. And they are replicated in different places in India. And that is quite useful because it provides buffer between uh, police and the, and, 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 and the department which discover this kind of uh, violence. In, I remember in 1998-99 when we did studies of the emergency department, I mean not me directly but my, my colleagues who did the studies of the emergency department, they found that one third of uh, cases of women with injuries in the emergency department were uh, of uh, domestic violence. And there is another one third where they are lying, they are not telling you the truth, although they have suffered injuries which is quite similar to the, to the domestic violence. So this is my second question. How do you think that the system could be, could be reformed within Pakistan so that uh, you could create this kind of centers which really help the women who are suffering, where the social workers and other fields, people from other fields can also participate and not just doctors. And my last question is very, very short question is that, have you, have you been listening cases of torture from the police custody, prison, and all. And what are the procedures involved then? Because we have been doing a lot of things on the, on, the, on, the, um, uh, on the gender issues. I have been doing a lot of work on the torture and, uh, uh, and, and the death penalty and the role of uh, medicine in that. So if you can throw some light on that, it will be useful. Thank you. I didn't catch the last part, please. Uh, last question, uh, death, police torture, I got that. But what about the death penalty? Yeah. Death penalty uh, uh, is a different issue. We are even not be directly involved, but uh, 
Okay. Uh, okay. Is there any is there any involvement of the psychiatrist? Certification, the certification of okay, death penalty, certification of death after death penalty. Yeah, you 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 can have a certification for fitness. Okay. And certificate after the death certificate after that. In India, okay. there was a there was a there was a court order uh, way back in nineteen ninety four. Okay, I'll, made, I'll come back to you on this question which, on the in, last in, one. In India, in India, India, when they high, uh, hang a person, the doctor is supposed to examine the person yes. when the person is yes. hanging. Yes. And exactly. if the person is not there, the doctor uh-huh. is asked to, uh, the doctor is supposed to ask them to continue him hanging. Now, yes, does it exactly. violate the uh, ethics of the doctor by, by not hmm. resuscitating hmm. the person? So okay. these are the three questions. If you, I'm sorry, I, I have been asking too many questions, but uh, no, I'm genuinely interested okay. in that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, sir, we actually follow your your textbooks here, uh, Modi. Uh, I have never, uh, matlab, uh, my my pet textbook or my Bible has been Parikh, and um, this this is what I started off with currently. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I knew Parikh. I knew Doctor Parikh. He was from Bombay. Okay, I, 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 I currently I'm reading Dixit, another one of yours, and uh, yeah, then okay. Christian Beach. We, I've, oh, I go through your textbooks quite regularly. The prejudice against women, yes, we follow your books. Our own books are very. Um, they aren't actually. We just have one textbook and maybe a couple more, but uh, Nasiba Wan is the only one that I've been following in Pakistan. So uh, how am I treated? Yeah, uh, in answer to your first question, yes, we are very prejudiced. The, the, the book shows prejudice against women. And it's sort of, but the words have been changed in the current editions, yes. So we are improving upon that as well. As far as the um, our own uh, baby steps are concerned in the Anti-Rape Act, we have uh, sort of destigmatized or de-victimized the victim. So our approach now would be uh, helping the victim become the survivor. I'm hoping that eventually we'll get to that, but yes, we will. Being a medical legal expert or additional police surgeon and a woman for that matter, how am I treated? I'm treated, and uh, if I say so myself, competent as compared to the others, so I'm treated with utmost respect by many and with disgust by few. So disgusted are those who don't want me there, uh, who would not want me to continue doing what I'm doing. They don't want me to bring about or talk about medical legal reforms. They don't want me to talk about improving the pro forma. They don't want me to talk about adding details which will shed light on their incompetencies. They want a plain paper on which to write the medical legal certificate so that there is no standard for the court to assess upon. And they certainly don't want me training the investigating officers. They certainly don't want me training the uh, judiciary judges. They don't want me training the medical legal officers to do the right thing. They don't want me doing anything. But like I said, many are quite, you know, they're appreciative. Many are appreciative. How do you handle the, the first group? You should have the, 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 those who are happy, no, those, those who are unhappy, those who are unhappy. Um, I face harassment daily. I face charges of or complaints being said to the higher authorities on a daily basis. I face direct threats. I face verbal threats. I face uh, there are days when I would be crying when I get home. And uh, that would be the day when I would tell my husband, okay, no, I'm not going tomorrow. But then I would wake up and with something like this, this forum would happen and that will bring me back. You should have seen me when I entered and I talked to Saleha and Amar Jafri and I said, okay, it was a horrible day yesterday because somebody complained of harassment against me because I had told her to be present for her job. And she complained that I'm harassing her. So she complained that to the uh, secretary sub. So I am dealing with that on a daily basis, several times in 24 hours. And it's always, a uh, it's okay. I've, I've become like, you know, hypertensive and <laughs> so I'm still I'm taking anti-hypertensive medication. So, okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, a connected question uh, uh-huh. to, to Dr. Amar's second question. So, you know, how has your experience been working as a woman in the field? But I've sometimes found that, yes, of course, it's difficult being a woman in such a field. But do you feel that being a woman has actually also worked to your advantage while working in the medical legal field? Do you feel that in, in a way that it has been beneficial or, or being a woman has been an asset? Yes, I can get away with quite a few things. A man wouldn't. But then again, I haven't met a man who would match my credentials. 
I except maybe my teachers, no, except no, maybe I, the ones I, who taught me all this. Yeah, I've always said it's so easy to be as good as any man. Yes. It's so for easy. women, it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Not Trust me. Deal. My teachers have been, I've been blessed with two really awesome teachers. Uh, again, from both worlds of forensic medicine. Forensic medicine, I've had Professor Farah Hussain Mirza. And from the medical legal uh, world, I've had uh, Dr. Hamid Padiyar Sab. So I have been blessed to be taught, to have been taught by people who taught me everything they knew. So yes, I've had an advantage over them. Matlab, I have been made to work like a slave. And I've been made to do things which it, hadn't I done, I wouldn't have been here. They have, it has worked to my advantage, yes. Okay, so uh, Amar Sab, to your second question, the referral pathways, I think that is what you wanted to discuss for domestic violence victims. Uh, we are talking about on anti-rape crisis cell. I'm going to, you know, sort of mix these two because anti-rape crisis cell eventually will be a GBV center, which will eventually cater to the domestic violence as well. But for now, the anti-rape crisis cells that are being set up, that are destined to set up in the, uh, entire in, uh, entire country in each district will involve support system, independent support advisors, social uh, support system, as well as legal support. We are hoping that ARCC the, or the anti-rape crisis cell will then serve as a place where a victim comes even if of domestic violence or sexual violence or whatever kind, will have a support system for that the person will not need to go anywhere else. So uh, we are trying, we are hoping. Currently, our support system is such that we have pockets of support system. Some are like in Sindh, we have one at uh, Sakhar for women. Again, a shelter, a Darul Aman. We have three in Karachi. And I think another one in uh, Mirpur Khas, I'm not sure about that, but they are being run with private, public, uh, private and government partnerships. Different NGOs are involved, but nothing concrete mechanism has been described as per law by the government. However, we hope to see a change in that because the current Anti-Rape Act, it's, it requires independent support advisors who will be paid on the payroll of the, who will be on the payroll of the government, or they might be working voluntarily. That depends on what kind of independent support advisors we will be getting, but we will have these people who will help a victim become a survivor. So now we are talking about turning a victim into survivor. Our uh, uh, focus has been trying to make or trying to develop a, a, a sort of a, an example, just like Mukhtar Amai. But Mukhtar Amai did it on her own. She came to, she became a survivor on her own. However, the state is now willing to help. The state is now taking notice of cases where um, um, accused are being let off scot-free. The state is now willing to take charge of its victims. That is as per law now. That's what we are trying to do. As far as your third question goes, uh, the reforms in Pakistan. Um, my, uh, I, I'll only talk about Sindh for now because I have served, uh, I've had the honor of serving on the Sindh Medical Legal Reforms Committee. And we worked again with Professor Farah Hussain Mirza, we worked on standardization of all of our performance, which will eventually uh, lead to better uh, witness or better testimony in a court of law, which is able to withstand cross-examination and thereby delivery of justice. And we have also worked on our job description, our hierarchies, our, um, there was none made to date. There was none to date, no job description for APS, no job description for MLO, no job description for police surgeon, nothing at all. But now we have made that. We have made SOPs and guidelines for special medical boards. We have made SOPs and guidelines for exhumation board, for custodial death board. Every single thing we have tried to uh, sort of define, explain in steps how it needs to be done as it is done under best medical legal practices. That's what we are hoping to do. Like I said, again, baby steps and light years behind you guys. As far as the police torture uh, wala question goes, yes, I get to see a lot of police torture cases. I get to see dead bodies coming from police torture. I get to see, uh, we have terms which we use half fry and full fry. Half fry is when, you know, the legs are injured in a manner that uh, render a person not able to run or walk. And full fry is like when a person is shot and uh, to death. 
So these are the terms that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, on an average, uh, I get to see about half fry cases in about maybe four or five in a day at JPMC and uh, custodial deaths or even um, cases of uh, uh, police, um, Matlab, uh, people, uh, people dying in police encounter, maybe a couple more, couple in, in a couple of days, maybe two in a couple of days, maybe, maybe you know, three in three days, maybe I'll get to see one or two or three. That depends, that varies uh, with every um, season, I think I should say, for want of a better term. So yes, I get to see a lot of police torture cases. Then again, then we have the custodial death bodies, which we get from either from jail or from uh, police lockups. For that, we are duty bound that we are supposed to involve the forensic expert who will be a professor of forensic medicine and the additional police surgeon of that particular area that happens to be me in Jinnah and the medical legal officer or the woman medical legal officer involved. I have seen cases of uh, dead custodial death, uh, custodial dead bodies uh, in de death occurring in custody uh, of women as well. So, that's so how, is like so i didn't get the last part of the question too so dr somaya uh, yeah i think we can ask uh, dr amar hmm. to expand on it later hmm. but uh, but just a very quick question connected to this is that that how uh, what is the mechanism for then reporting such deaths or such cases of torture okay so basically whenever police does a half right it's like again a term which we are used to now it's it has been picked up by social media as well and now it's doing the rounds so uh it's always the police who brings us the victim and they will tell us that he was trying to run away or uh, it was an encounter or whatever and snatching and we shot and he fell so we are duty bound we have a letter and we write the medical legal certificate and uh, that's about it and we send the patient the refer the injured to whichever department he or she not she i'm sorry never seen a police encounter she never never seen a she here there in in such cases though so, uh, that that injured will be referred accordingly and custodial death can be brought in from lockups custodial death can be brought in from uh, police encounters uh, custodial death can be brought in from jails that depends that those are the tricky ones from jails those are the tricky ones because we might have uh, people dying from natural causes in jail so we can't label all of these although they are custodial deaths but they we can't label them to be caused by the police or by the law enforcement agencies so that is the tricky one where we form the custodial death board take all the relevant samples and make sure that a cause of death is arrived upon whether it was because of torture or it was some disease related issue sorry so on the report so for somebody who's half fry that report will go to the inspector that go that report goes to the concerned thana the sho yes and beyond yeah. that uh, you don't have any follow up as to what happened i have yet to appear in any case in any such case in a court of law so one would wonder what happens after the report goes and it's lodged somewhere yeah uh, I don't it. know about that because I've never been uh, approached by a court of law to be or summoned by a court of law in any such case. Hello, hello. Can I say just uh, I think in uh, in uh, for torture, uh, um, uh, you know, survivor examination. Um, I have been involved in uh, a group which is which has prepared what is called Istanbul Protocol. I, 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 have you heard of it? There is an Istanbul protocol yeah, yeah, yeah. for how Istanbul to protocol. medically yes. examine the, the survivors of uh, torture. G. And uh, it is being revised just now. I think by, by the, the middle of this year, it will be a revised version will be published. Um, so one thing that I had found in India was that uh, uh, the medical record that is created of the, of the torture survivor is uh, not adequate uh, in order to get justice. The other thing I found was that uh, when the medical officer or the, or the medical legal officer examines the torture victim or the survivor, they normally do it in the presence of uh, police. The police does not allow the, the, the person to go out of sight under the pretext that he will run away. And as a consequence, uh, the person never provides the full medical history and the and the background history of, of of what happened and i have seen very few medical officers who have uh, guts to ask a police officer to go out although in social protocol and a bureaucratic protocol in public hospital doctor's position is higher 
than the inspector who is who brings uh, bring the victim. And the last thing is that uh, oftentimes doctors uh, refer the person for the physical checkup or physical treatment, but uh, torture, a systematic torture, creates psychosocial trauma, and it lasts for much much longer time than uh, the physical wounds. You know, so it requires a lot of counseling and uh, uh, psychotherapeutic support. Now, I have found that that kind of uh, torture rehabilitation center are not there. In, in Pakistan, it used to be, there used to be one in, uh, in Rawalpindi, where Dr. Mehendi used to run a center called Rahat. That was in 1988-89. Mehbub Mehendi, if you, I don't know if you have heard of him. No. He passed away, but I had met him in, uh, in, 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 in Paris in 1987, and then he went back and he started this center for the, for the refugees coming from Afghanistan. In Islamabad, he started, and it was called Rahat. And they also, they used to publish a, a newsletter also. But uh, uh, that was a center which uh, was working for the rehabilitation and treatment of the torture survivors. But they were mainly refugees. I don't know whether they, you have any other center which helps the, the torture survivor to take care of the long-term uh, psychosocial needs and the rehabilitation needs. India doesn't have one, you know, India doesn't have even one rehabilitation center like this. If India doesn't have one, so how can you expect us to have one? <laughs> Sir, Don't we are, we are like still that. in the Bronze Age. We are still in the Bronze Age. But yes, we are talking about uh, shelter homes. We are talking about, uh, but not for psychosocial uh, tortures till now. As far as, sir, apka jo, uh, your observations are extremely correct when it comes to medical record for custodial deaths or even in custody cases, torture cases, they are highly, highly, highly inadequate. In fact, when I get a dead body from jail, for example, all I get is a parcha saying uh, that he died of cardiorespiratory failure. That's it. Nothing before, nothing after, no hepatitis B, no hepatitis C. And we would look at the body and we would wonder ke how come the wounds were so infected that they had reached to the hip bone. And uh, all we have is uh, cardiorespiratory failures. Yes, medical records are extremely uh, sketchy to, again, to say. It includes just a death certificate. Uh, torture victims, yes, they are uh, examined in the presence of police and police is the pressurizing factor over here. I have had this experience firsthand when they will tell us not to write blackening if there was blackening us around the wound. Blackening would mean that the person was shot at a close range for people who are not uh, uh, used to dealing with you know, injuries, uh, firearm injuries. So they would tell us not to write, please, Dr. Saab, don't write this because this would then mean that uh, we, didn't shoot the we, we didn't shoot the injured where we, where we said that we shot him, him from. And as far as the guts are concerned, uh, I think, sir, after talking to, after hearing me out, I think you would know that, yes, I have guts to kick them out of the room while I'm examining the victim, but I won't say the same for the rest of my colleagues. Medical history, like I said, yes, it is incomplete. You're very right. And uh, psychosocial support. So far, we have had no, um, no support uh, or provision of even support or plans of provision of an even support or to our systematic torture victims. I cannot go uh, anything beyond that for, for fear of being, you know, I'll stay quiet. Dr. Murad has uh, put her, his question. Uh, what kind of support do you think you need from the medical fraternity in Pakistan, education, research and training, et cetera? Uh, the last part. From whom? Support from whom? I was asking that hmm. what kind of support do you require from the medical fraternity research and training in your field? Education, research, and training. Education, research, and training. I would want house job in medical legal one. Two, um, I would want to go Actually, it should be a medical legal forensic partnership. 
So you make the professor a person who has had medical legal experience. This will be a win-win situation because when you have people working in medical legal department and they're given a chance to actually proceed or improve as part of the faculty, they will stay. Like I turned it into a career path. I turned it into a career path. I have never been able to meet anyone else who did the same while staying in the system. So we make medical legal services, medical legal uh, uh, department a career path. We offer our junior MLOs a chance to be a lecturer, a demonstrator first in their initial years of training. Six years, you do demonstrations in the Department of Forensic, six months, you do demonstrations in the Department of Forensic Medicine. And for six months, you work in the medical legal section. And then you combine that with diploma in medical jurisprudence and let them advance further. So as they keep on going, they are not even they're not only getting their degrees, advancing in faculty hierarchy, they are also becoming much better medical legal examiners. Till the time that we don't do this, our services, our quality of services is not likely to improve. May I? Ji. So carrying this forward, I think one is as a career pathway. But I think, I, I mean, I'm presuming Dr. Mirad because I'm also thinking the same thing as members of the medical fraternity, not as an MLO or yeah. having an inclination to uh, become one. As a medical, as a member of the fraternity, how do you see us able to, uh, you know, help you out? Yeah, I was coming to that. Besides, I mean, you know, one professor of CHK, you know, pursuing it, how can you make that system easier? One is, yes, for us to the eyes will only see what the mind knows. So one awareness is one thing, but the beyond that, how beyond do you see? Beyond that, I think uh, we should have, uh, the, it's now a modular system. So what I would suggest is okay, at the uh, uh, education level or um, professors of surgery, professors of medicine, they can include scenarios. It should be made mandatory that add medical legal scenarios to your list of questions. Don't just tell us that, um, uh, 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 you know, a fracture can be, uh, give us a cause. How did it occur? Let the student think about the causative, the causation. But for, we need to implement that. But for, okay, had it, he was okay, but for this he would not have suffered the fracture. So we add the but for thing and we add the medical legal scenarios. You tell me, madam, how many times do you put in such questions which have a medical legal angle? I don't think ever. So we need to. You add the social, yes, but never medical legal. So we add medical legal in our other subspecialities and we add other subspecialities into forensic medicine. So instead of lumping forensic medicine in say about uh, say uh, in like, you know, in just uh, uh, six months or eight months, you take it to gyne ops as well. Teach the person learning gyne ops how to examine a case of abortion to document it. Teach a person learning upset, uh, uh, orthopedics to identify victims suffering from chronic abuse. Teach a person doing pediatrics to identify cases which require your help in medical legal terms. It takes two to play. Alone, me alone working and me alone identifying that won't work. We, there, we need medical reforms. We need medical education reforms more than ever now, more than ever if this subject is to be brought forward. Sujata also is raising. Yeah, uh, so ma'am, I just wanted to know more about the uh, anti-rape crisis center. So this center, they would be in the hospital or outside of the hospital? No, and the other thing was... Uh, uh, please say that hello? again. I didn't catch it. It's like a bit mumbled. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you mentioned about anti rape crisis centers. So this center anti rape crisis be... cells. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it will be inside the hospital or outside of the hospitals. Okay. The other thing was uh, whether these centers will be providing comprehensive healthcare response to the survivors. Because okay. uh, here in India, 
uh, we do have similar kind of centers, which is called one stop crisis centers. And uh, the other thing is Delasa Crisis Center, which is the first uh, crisis centers, hospital based crisis centers in mm. India, which mm. are yeah. in the hospital and provide uh, psychosocial yes. care to the survivors, all uh, violence survivors, like be it a domestic violence survivor or sexual violence survivor. Because okay. uh, this center, if they only focusing on the treatment, mm. then it may not help because uh, the survivor also needs psychosocial support in yeah. care. Yeah, let me. Um, yes, I, I agree with you. Uh, actually, we for, we based it on your one stop protection center, one stop crisis center. We based the ARCC uh, uh, sort of, you know, the entire template has been based on what you guys have already done. And to some extent, actually, we, we were working while we were working on this particular aspect that we called the one stop protect, we called it a one stop protection center, which we would have set up in SIN. But since now it's coming from the federal, it's called a anti rape crisis cell. So, anti rape crisis cell essentially will have, let me explain it will be based in a public hospital public hospital by by public hospital i mean a government run hospital and uh, it will have um, um, infrastructure which will uh, uh, give enough space for medical legal examination for legal consultation for psycho uh, psychological uh, uh, for psychological assessment then and there and uh, it will also have the uh, statement taking facility from the police by the police actually uh, that is the victim can will be able to give statement to the police right inside the ARCC. So our uh, target is that we we give a, a victim a safe haven and that will eventually be connected to maybe a shelter. One such shelter has already be, already been established at Sadar Police Station, Women Police Station, and uh, we are hoping that it will work out in a way that the victim will not have to go anywhere. And the referral pathway will include a mandatory uh, visit to the gynae, to psychiatry. Gynae would be for postcoital contraception, medicine for uh, hepatitis, um, uh, sorry, um, HIV prophylaxis, and um, a hepatitis B and C screening in case, especially in the cases of gang rapes. And uh, alongside that, it's mandatory mandatory that the psychiatric assessment will be done and psychological rehab initiated. So uh, we are talking about the social uh, rehab uh, for that. We have independent support advisors who will be assigned a particular victim and they will be then be taking the victim from desk A to desk Z. So they will be like following through. Desk Z would be the um, ultimate uh, presentation in a court of law um, and culmination of the case. So yes, we are working on that. It will take time, but hopefully we should have one functioning provided I have a notification coming through. So we should have one functioning soon in JPMC. Thank you. Uh, it, it, just going back to about a career pathway. And I'm asking this question because I don't know. <laughs> So currently, you also mentioned, you know, maybe have some kind of a diploma, etc. Is there any anywhere in the world today, an actual training program, like in, for surgery, you would train, get your CPSP, or in surgery, you could do a, go the other route and get a master's of surgery. Is there any equivalent to that in your field? Um, I have done diploma in medical jurisprudence and uh, that is available, a two-year diploma course, which is, it's available, yes, in Dow University, it's available. And uh, I've done that and I completed that in 2012. Uh, I've done that. And now I'm following a four-year FCPS in forensic medicine. Like I said, again, there is no training as such in medical legal because we need the practice as well. It's not just about the, because I'm already working in the field, so that's why I'm so practiced. But for someone who is doing a diploma, uh, they just need to visit the uh, medical legal section, say about, you know, once a week, or visit the mortuary, say about 10 times during their two years, and visit the anatomy and physiology and pathology departments and all that to go through that. So essentially, what I am suggesting is that incorporate these, allow the medical legal officers to follow through this. When medical legal officers study and learn and they become diploma holders, allow them to be a part of the faculty, make them teach. So when you make them teach, it works. Having said that, I developed a protocol with, uh, I'm, I'm a master trainer with UNFPA and, I've uh, and a clinical management of rape specialist. So I've developed a protocol which is especially for our part of the world. And we, I have imparted training to medical legal officers who then deal with uh, 
rape cases or domestic violence cases or any cases coming to them on the basis of the internationally accepted guidelines. I've developed protocols for the training of mortuary assistants. I'm on the verge of training. I'm uh, verge of training, uh, verge of developing again another module for forensic nursing. So we need to train all of these people, even the ward boys. They can be taught to, but they need to be taught. Ward boy is a ward boy's job in a medical legal center or a section is different from a ward boy in a ward. We need to understand the nuances of how to collect samples have been collected, how to seal them, how to make sure that the chain of custody is in short. See, we are talking about admissibility of evidences. We are we, we have to keep in mind the final aspect of any medical legal case that I document until the time that is not provided or done, we will not see any improvement. But in, you said uh, CPSP, the four Gee. year there. Now for surgery and other places that involves actual hands-on work. My uh, e-log e also requires me to see all these cases, but uh, there are seven of us and um, that, are, that, that are enrolled in the FCPS forensic medicine program. And uh, they will visit the medical legal section and they will collect the reports and they will put it in the e-log. I'm sorry to say this, I shouldn't have said it, but- No, 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 that's an important thing because the, for uh, CPSP, I mean, for all its other specialties, you actually require to, to do To see the, the patient, work. yes. Yeah. The but problem that is that we need to have a proper protocol. We need to have people who go and sit in the medical legal section. We need to go and sit in the mortuary. Post the us, I'm already working there. So I get to see the cases firsthand. My cases are detailed. My cases are, I have seen them. I can explain them inside out. But same will not be the case for others. So that, that is one area. Yes. You can. Uh, what is it? Because uh, uh, connected to this, so what I, the, the feeling that I'm getting then is that uh, the medical legal, because it's it's more of a practical side and not the mm -hmm. academic side. Mm -hmm. So the forens the people training uh, in FCPS uh, forensics are not learning from the actual medical legal people out there. Yeah, they should go sit work like medical legal officers yeah let them work and but also Take learn ownership. right because they it, will it has to be a surgeon so for example a surgeon would be yes. tr training a I am, resident i am required as per e-log i am required to have an observer status in year one uh, performing under supervision under in year two and in year three performing without uh, supervision and i feel the same will continue in my year four as well because i'm currently in year three but the problem is I'm already doing it without supervision. So that's not the point. And I'm learning all of it. I have learned all of it. For doing this uh, FCPS course has actually made me even better because I'm opening up the books and reading it through as well. Are you on the, fa Sorry, are you on the faculty? No. I think that's where you need to be. Eventually. That's where I need to be. And that's once where you I need do to be. that, that's where I'm visiting faculty with I'm, I, I teach postgrads in uh, I no, teach undergrads. What, yeah. I teach postgrads. I do uh, trainings, but I would want to be a part. It should be connected. Yes. Once it's connected, that gives me an incentive. That gives me a way yeah. uh, for Dr. Murad. So that will, I have eight research projects going on right now. Eight. Two of them are with, are with uh, Professor Murad Musa. I'm also working on gap analyses out of my own interest. Yeah. Out of my own interest. Dr. Not because I am. Dr. Sumaya, you need to be on the faculty in CPSP. Eventually... Huh? Yeah. My oh, my no, no, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. She's in the third year now. Ma'am, my uh, supervisor uh, passed away last year in August, Professor Farat Mirza. So we don't have any other supervisors now. So my name is Dr. Farat, and I'm a supervisor. Absolutely, you are. I have a question. Yes. 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 This is the, 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 the toughest kind of career that I could think of. You do all of that and you do all of that of dedication, uh, avoiding corruption, avoiding going insane yourself. Um, 
sidestepping uh, irritants like people who are harassing you and all of that how do you remain sane <laughs> we had actually discussed that but that they have today how do you how do i remain sane how do you uh, are you sure i'm sane <laughs> So that should, we can discuss later but really I mean, so how do you how okay, is it that um, you remain you know i i don't watch movies with murder i don't watch movies uh, i i watch movies which are like popcorn movies i watch a lot of movies i read a lot of novels most of my novels are related to my own field but i would prefer not to i i hear to a lot of you know uh cheeky songs which don't make sense i don't want to see dramas which talk about domestic violence i don't want to see dramas which talk about torture i don't want to see any such thing but that's what it's like i can't i can't the thing that keeps me i don't know uh, maybe because i work with animals a lot and they bring me a lot of peace i work with animals so that and it is in addition to that i have a small uh, um, like i have interests i i work for orphanage i work for uh, that's what keeps me sane i think songs aajkal the current favorite is it has always been a favorite um atif aslam stajdar e haram always a favorite and uh, trust me what keeps me sane are forums like this what keeps me sane are uh, uh, when people will are people I, i'll tell you as i'll i'll tell you a small story no i won't take much of a time i was sitting at jama cloth market jama cloth market is our go to place now for dawites it's a go to place whenever a, a dawite from uh, abroad comes and we would go and sit there and have halim or chaat or chola or whatever so i was sitting there with my friend who had come from england and she said ki we are going to reminisce how it used to be so we were sitting there having chaats and cholas and all of a sudden this woman comes sits in my literally in my feet grabs my feet and i was like this oh my god giving the mug situation of karachi i said now the uh, women are even they've started to what why is she here for is she here for myself so she she was crying and she said doc saab you remember me i didn't uh, she said you came uh, itna mahina pehle for for the evidence you you examined my daughter and she had been raped by our neighbor uh, the court gave um, a uh, conviction today and uh, he was punished for 15 years so i had gone to your office to meet you there and they told me that he will be in jama cloth i had the office right opposite to that na so i came here listening uh, i came here searching for you so that keeps me sane that keeps me sane and jafri sir i must commend you on that my first jafri has a name which has a lot of you know uh, jafri is a name which is which has a lot of importance in my career my career path sort of developed on this name so my first for my first evidence in a court of law uh that was my first in a judicial magistrate court and i didn't know anything there was a decent most decent gentleman in my office jafri saab we used to call him he was uh, in administration he took me there so my first evidence in an atc court regarding a sexual abuse of a 4 year old child uh rehmat husain jafri saab was my uh, judge over there and he gave me a letter of commendation on my first evidence so now jafri saab this is probably the first that i'll leave it at that thank you so much thank you so much dr samaya i think it uh, it was great hearing about your experiences so we have learned all of us i can say that about myself i've learned quite a bit sitting over here Yes. In fact, we've had सवाल बहुत सारे अभी वहां भी है स्क्रीन के ऊपर भी हमारे बहुत सारे हैं मगर एक जो था ना जाते आते एक सवाल मैं आपसे नहीं करूंगा आपसे करूंगा सो कैमरा उधर ले आइए ये आप जो है वो डॉक्टर तारिक सोहेल आपके सरताज हैं सो ही हजबेंड ऑफ डॉक्टर सो सरताज सर के ताज अब उधर एक लफ्ज बोला है वो मैंने इस पे एक और एक और एक और होगा डॉक्टर मौजूद फोरम सो बट द क्वेश्चन इज के दिस रिक्वायर्स अ लॉट ऑफ सपोर्ट हर लाइफ एंड हर जॉब रिक्वायर्स अ लॉट ऑफ सपोर्ट यू हैव टू ब्यूटीफुल चिल्ड्रन ग्रोन अप सक्सेसफुल नाउ व्हाट सो सो एंड वुमेन इन कैरियर्स एटसेट्रा ऑलवेज ऑब्वियसली इज अ टीम वर्क मेन require women's help women require but here i think this has been a extraordinary um, uh, situation uh, so tell us a little bit just a little bit uh, about how you have been able to support your wife and uh, uh, and your family uh, during her, her very tough uh, career yes uh, as far as support is concerned i think that uh, being a doctor and a practicing doctor uh 
I always uh, try my level best to understand the professional values and the ethics of a doctor. Uh, as she herself told uh, all of you that she came into this particular field accidentally, right? But since then, she's taken very seriously and she uh, chose this field as a career. As far as my support is concerned, uh, I was, I am, and I'll be always there to do whatever is needed that can help her to go further in a field number one and to improve on things. Not only that, try her level best to bring about some changes into this existing system of socialized corruption and uh, so many other things. So whatever she is doing, uh, I think uh, it's not me, she's a support to me. She is a support to me and uh, in her absence, when she's not around, we usually, uh, whenever you know she's not around and uh, if I'm supposed to take care of my kids, like my, my Bitya and my Beta. So uh, I do that. Even when the kids were small, and they were toddlers and uh, you know they were very small. Uh, I used to perform my duties in the morning hours and she was in the night and uh, she, was, she used to be on call during those days. And whenever she uh, got a call, uh, and she was born to go to the call. So we used to our kids along with us. We both of us, both of us, we used to go to the hospital or to her center where she was posted. And uh, I was uh, assigned the job to Bete Goya Beti Godmutage. And I have to stay outside. Uh, so basically teamwork team. so that, that it is, is so yes. That's success yes so ye, ye, yes ye, so i think on that note i think we should ji, yeah. haan, ji. he has been without him i wouldn't have been here Trust Trust me. Me. exactly without, him, care, without either here. so it's a teamwork which is actually how how success he is has actually given me so much liberty to explore to do to uh go forth and into an basically i took a path which nobody has ever traveled in this part of the world so he gave me the confidence to go on that he never held me back, never. I think both your children are very fortunate. And I hope one day they will realize that. Thank you, ma'am. Hello. But they simply refuse to, you know, become doctors, both of them. Okay. It's like this uh, till now, they haven't realized anything, but uh, they're they know they don't want to be doctors. They don't want a life like ours. That's okay. That's okay. So on that note, uh, thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, it was a great conversation and I, uh, we're really happy that we were able to have Dr. Samaya over here physically. So until next time. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.